Jack. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. It has been a, a good day thus far. Uh, hopefully you've had a great time uh, being part of our morning Bible study. Uh, if you weren't part of a class, we've got one for everyone. So uh, for all ages. And if you get here and we don't have one, we'll make one. All right. Uh, but the Lord has been very gracious to us uh, this weekend. Hopefully you've had a chance to enjoy outdoors. It's been beautiful, a little, little windy, but it's been good. Uh, I do want to remind you of a few things that are coming up in the life of our fellowship. Uh, today is Connection Sunday, uh, so we won't have our evening services, but we are encouraging you to come back on campus a little earlier and help us connect with our community. Uh, as you know, next week is our community Easter egg hunt, and we're excited about that, uh, having some interest in our community already about it. Uh, but today our plan is to canvas uh, the neighborhood surrounding the church uh, much like we did a while back when we started back up on Wednesday night. But we need your help. Uh, I'll just be real with you. Last time we didn't have a lot of help. We need more help. Uh, so encourage you to come today. Three o'clock we'll do that. But maybe you're saying, I'm not up for walking around. I'm not up for uh, passing out flyers. We've got Easter eggs that need to be stuffed too. We've got all kinds of things for you to do. Uh, so, And we'll even let you eat one piece of candy for every hundred eggs you stuff. <laughs> hey, that's a good deal. I mean, we could we could negotiate and maybe make it down to 75, but um, but we really do need your help. Uh, we'll be again be in the community passing out flyers. We'll have a station set up in the 
uh, Welcome Center, or not the Welcome Center, the Fellowship Hall, which could be a Welcome Center, uh, and we'll have some stuffing of eggs happening down there. So uh, we're excited about next week. Hopefully you are too. Hopefully you're making plans to be here on Saturday at 11 o'clock as we connect with our community. Now some of you may have already saw the forecast and it's kind of iffy. For some reason, if it gets washed out, we already have a rain date planned uh, for the third, for the next Saturday. So I encourage you to be a part of it no matter what day it's on. And if for some reason you can't, I know that your, your prayers will, will be with us. Uh, other things are happening in the life of the fellowship. I encourage you to, to check out your bulletin on that. We do have a, a thank you uh, card I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is from Miss Edith. And just real quickly share with you. Thank you all for your prayers, cards, flowers, and food. Our church family is loving and means so much. We love you all, Edith Phillips and Lee Bailey. Uh, so I know you'll continue to be in prayer for her and as well as others within our fellowship uh, that are in need during this time. Well, let's join our hearts uh, in prayer. Father, we thank you for what you have in store for us. Or we are thankful that you've brought us together today to fellowship or to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, I just pray today as we worship you, Lord, as that our hearts will be drawn close to you. Lord, as we sing forth your praise, that it will ring from deep within our souls, that these are truths that we, uh, we trust in, truths that we live by, truths that, that bring us through some of the darkest times as well as help us to celebrate in the greatest moments. And Father, we pray for those in our fellowship that are here. We pray that this morning, uh, Lord, that they may be encouraged. We pray that this morning they may be reminded of who they are in you. And Lord, we pray for those that are not here this morning, whether it be because of illness or whether it be because of um, whether continue to, to, to be at home during uh, times such as this. But I pray wherever they are, Lord, that they'll um, be aware of your presence and know that they're missed here on the hill at Echota. Father, we are thankful for what you have in store for us. May you be exalted in all that happens in this room and among us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on, lead us, brother. As uh, Brother Lucas was talking to us about the Easter egg hunt, I couldn't help but go back to some memories. And I'm sure maybe you did as well, too. Memories of getting together with your grandparents at your grandparents' places to do Easter egg hunts. I don't know if you did that. It was a, it was a big thing uh, in our in our in the in our my mom's side of the family and my dad's as well too but on mom's family there was seven kids uh so it's a big family and and all the all my aunts and uncles they all had big families and so the easter gathering was always a, a big deal and I, as i was sitting here i could i could picture the the pine thicket that they would hide the eggs in i could smell the pine straw in my head just then as it was going so a lot of good memories but there's also a memory that stands out and I, I promise i won't take too long on this one uh do we all have that uncle that's a prankster or an aunt that was a prankster well we got a we also have a, a yellow jacket flying around so there we go but anyway um our uncle convinced us one particular easter to crack our eggs on our forehead um, but we didn't realize that of all the eggs that he set up, he colored a raw one. And uh, one of my cousins was unfortunate enough to have that egg at that point in time, so we all popped our eggs on our forehead, and then my cousin popped and then wore an egg as it was coming down his face. So great memories, and, and uh, just, just how important little things like Easter egg hunts will stick out in our minds. As we go in, if you want to, guys, go ahead and bring up the screen for the, uh, for the uh, songs. You know, we had snow falling the other day, and I'm hoping it works this morning. Uh, looks like we may have a, there we go. We've gone from snow to pollen. I don't know if you can see it as well, too. So let's go ahead and send, tis the season for pollen, I guess. So great is the Lord. Hymn number 12 is our first hymn today. <clears throat> Great is the Lord, He is holy and just, by His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true, by His mercy He proves He is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, and now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord, great is the Lord, great is 
the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord. He is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. Now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Good morning. This morning I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know and have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their spirit. They will soar on the wings like eagles, and they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Will you join me in prayer at this time? Heavenly Lord, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us back in your house to worship you. I just thank you for all that you do for us, your love and your forgiveness of our sins, Lord. And I just thank you for your son who died for our sins so we could find everlasting life with him, with through him, with you. I, I pray, Lord, you forgive us for our sins. And I pray that you be with our service today. Be with Brother Lucas as he brings his message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand again. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. You may be seated. Children, I think it's your time to come forward at this time.
The early church was made up of almost all Jewish believers who were persecuted for following Jesus. Because their lives had become difficult, many believers began to wonder if following Jesus was worth it. Some may have even thought about giving up on Jesus altogether. The Holy Spirit helped a Christian leader write words of encouragement to the early church in the book of Hebrews. He wrote, Long ago, God spoke to his people through prophets. Now he speaks through Jesus. Jesus is God the Son, and he is like God in every way. Jesus is better than angels because he is God's Son, the eternal King and creator of everything who sits at God's right hand. But Jesus humbled himself to become lower than the angels for a time when he became a man. Jesus became a person like us to die and then rise again. Jesus' work rescues people from sin. All who believe in him become his brothers and sisters. Jesus became like us in every way so he could become a merciful and faithful high priest for us. Because Jesus suffered and was tempted, he is able to help us when we are tempted. This is why Jesus is the greatest. He is greater even than Moses, who was a faithful servant of God. Jesus was an even better servant. God used Moses to bring the law to his people, but God used Jesus to bring the gospel. This is why we cannot turn away from Jesus. Instead, we need to encourage one another each day so that we don't give in to sin. We don't want to be like the Israelites who Moses led out of Egypt and then rebelled against God and perished in the wilderness. The Israelites wanted a land of rest, but even Joshua could not provide rest for God's people. We want to enter into God's rest and Jesus has provided something even better than land, spiritual rest in him. Because Jesus is such a great high priest for us, we can hold fast to our faith. Jesus knows our weaknesses because he became a human and was tempted, although he never sinned. Because of Jesus, we can approach God with boldness and God will give us mercy and grace. This is why Jesus is better than anything and why we cannot turn away from him. The first covenant that God provided through Moses has been replaced by a second, better covenant through Jesus. Salvation is found only in Jesus. Jesus is better than anyone and anything. He is the better prophet, the better priest, and the better king. Everyone who trusts in Jesus has salvation from sin through his perfect life, death, and resurrection. Good morning. I got a little early today. Well, the video was over. I didn't have to talk to you. Well, what did we learn today in our video? Anybody know? What about, what, what's the main theme of today's video? Y'all story about the Sunday school? Amen. What is it? Who's, who's the best thing you know? Jesus. That's right. You know, just like our video told us, there's a lot of good things, aren't there? A lot of good people. But Jesus is the best, right? And what makes him the best? Number one, he's God's son, right? He came to this earth. And he died for us. He lived a perfect life and then died and rose again. He went through the same things we go through. Sometimes, you know, when we're tempted to do things we're not supposed to, and it's easy to do them, isn't it? But, you know, Jesus, he was able to withstand those temptations. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And that makes him better than anything. So if we trust in him and follow him, even though sometimes we get a little discouraged, sometimes it's hard, isn't it? But, you know, they told us in Hebrews when they wrote that book, Keep on keeping on life. That's my own terminology in it. But we need to keep on and keep on serving him because he is the best, okay? So let's remember that this next week and the rest of our lives, that Jesus is the best there is, and we want to follow and serve him, okay? So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to kind of come to this house and learn more about you. And Lord, we thank you that you are the best. Lord, you're, the, you're everything that we could ever need, want, or have. I pray, Lord, that we would lean upon that and uh, just 
and marks ourselves in your love and show that love to others as we go out. Thank you for loving us and all that you do for us. Amen. Thank you, guys. Choir, come on up. The Solid Rock, hymn number 406. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. All other ground is indeed sinking. If it is not built on Him, we labor in vain. I invite you to turn in your Bible this morning to Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Uh, Today we're actually concluding our series on holy habits. Um, We have had uh, quite a journey uh, through the Scriptures and um, spent a good bit of time in the Gospels as we've reflected on many of these holy habits, looking at the Sermon of the Mount and Jesus' teachings and other areas and in, in Paul's writings. Uh, we've talked about everything from the, the spiritual discipline of prayer and the priority it should have in our life and in our ministries here on the hill. We've talked about the discipline of Bible study and how if we were to hear from God, we must be in His Word. We've talked about the discipline of, of uh, fellowship, uh, which we'll talk about today. We've talked about the discipline of stewardship. We've talked about the discipline of service and evangelism and fasting. So many things, I pray, as we've ventured into the Scripture and and studied these things, that you've uh, examined your life and seen if if indeed these are practices that you've embraced and practices that you've committed to as a follower of Christ. Because these are all indeed expectations that the Lord has for us as we seek to grow closer to Him and to be more like Him. Well, as I alluded to earlier and kind of already let the cat out of the bag, today's focus is on fellowship, um, the, the holy habit of fellowship, the spiritual discipline of fellowship. We're a follower of Jesus Christ. Fellowship with other believers should be something that's a part of our journey, a part of our, our development as a believer. Now, uh, many of you have uh, run into folks that... Uh, and. Uh, I just this past week had the opportunity to speak some truth into some students' lives on, on the same issue, but you've run into some folks that they have said, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, but I don't, I don't have to go to church. I, me, and, me and God have our own little talk right here on Sunday morning or maybe some other morning or, or when I'm driving to work. And I don't need to be at church. I don't need to be up there with a bunch of folks that don't, that don't know what's going, what I'm going through and they don't know how to speak truth into my life. I don't need to, and you've heard it, I don't need to be there with a bunch of them hypocrites. We've all heard that. When we look at Scripture, we see that us hypocrites need each other. Let's just be real. We're all broken people. We're all sinful people. We're all corrupt people. We're all a work in progress, and we need each other. And Paul is writing here under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, talking about um, what it means to be a follower of Christ. What are some of those things that need to be exhibited in our life? 
And part of that is fellowship. We need each other. I'm so thankful that, you know, more and more people are coming back on campus. Of course, this is an unprecedented time in and, and, and our community and, and such. Because it's an encouragement uh, to see uh, people in the seats, obviously, but it's encouragement for your lives to be here and, and for you to fellowship and to, to pray with each other and to encourage each other. Because that's what we're called to be as a church. So I pray this morning as we understand this discipline of fellowship, that you understand your role that you have to play as a part of the fellowship that meets here on the hill at each other Baptist Church. I pray also that you realize not only your role, but why you do it. And then how often you should do it. So let's look together in the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 10. Starting in verse 23, I believe this is a familiar passage for us. It says this in verse 23 of Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's, Father, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, time in your word now, and I pray as we look to your scriptures, Lord, that you speak freely through, through me, Father. Lord, that your spirit may move in a powerful way in, in, in my life, Lord, in such a way that as you speak through me, Lord, it may encounter the lives of others that are here to fellowship. That we understand, Lord, the hope that we have in you. That we understand the, the commitment that we have in you, the, the call to persevere that you have placed before us. And Lord, that we understand that if we are to follow you, then we are to bear fruit, and that fruit is to love each other, is to minister to each other, and to minister to the world in which we live. So Father, I pray today, as we work our way through this selection of Scripture, that you speak freely to our heart, and call us to yourself. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning we'll, we'll see three things as we often do. Some of you are probably thinking at this point, I've been here with you two years. You know, sometimes you got two points, but you know, when you hit the three points, we know it's going to be a long one. So here you go. Uh, now we'll see what the Lord does. But, um, but we see three points today. The first is the source of fellowship or the source for fellowship. Why is it that we fellowship? The second being the purpose. And then the third that we'll see today is the practice. And we see all of this within our passage of Scripture as we will work through this today. You know, the source of fellowship, we, we see right out of the gate as we look back in verse 23, tells us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. The confession of our hope. Now, let's think about that for a moment. What does it mean to confess something? Well, it means to, to tell the truth, tell, uh, tell what we know about something, to confess it with our mouth as well as confess it with our life. And this passage here, is, as the, the writer of Hebrews is, is telling us that we are to hold fast to what we uh, uh, proclaim. We're to hold fast to what we believe in. And from Hebrews and from the understanding from a Christian fellowship, we believe in what Christ has done on our behalf. Our hope, our, our, our confidence is in the work of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've worked through the book of Hebrews in the past or you're familiar with it, we see that the writer of Hebrews writes in such a way that he's trying to connect with the Jewish audience and he's connecting the dots between the Jewish sacrificial system and the work that's accomplished in Jesus Christ. So using that same terminology or that same context, when he talks about this confession of hope, this belief in what Christ has accomplished, he is noting that we are wicked people that needed a high priest, that needed someone to come and make a sacrifice for us, and Jesus was that perfect high priest. He was that perfect priest that came and made a sacrifice for us. In fact, he sacrificed himself for us. He gave his very life so that we could live. He gave his very life so that we could be forgiven of our sins. The, the terminology that we see throughout the New Testament, even uh, prophesied in the Old Testament, he became an atonement for our sin. 
became a substitute sacrifice for us. And the life we now lead, we lead through him. We live through him. So as we consider this confession of hope that we have, it is a belief that Jesus has saved us. It is a belief that Jesus has forgiven us of our sin. It is a belief that our life is now found in him. So as we seek to identify with who we are as an individual, as, as we seek to identify as, uh, as why we gather together on the hill on Sunday, sometimes Wednesdays, it's because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And it's important too, as we look at this passage, we see that it's not just anchored on us and what we have done, but it's anchored, our, our hope is anchored in the fact that God is faithful. Again, looking back at our, our passage, it says, let us hold fast confession of our hope without wavering. You know, be persevere. For he who is promised is faithful. God is going to keep his promises to us. You know, as we look at scripture, we see time and time again, as God tells his people, I'm going to do this, and he accomplishes it. We look at the Old Testament. He tells the Israelites, I'm going to bring deliverance to you, and he accomplishes it. He tells the Israelites, I'm going to lead you to the promised land, and he accomplishes it. We go on down the road, we see the prophecies, over 300 and something prophecies that talk about Jesus who's going to show up on the scene, and Jesus shows up on the scene. He accomplishes those purposes, and we talk about the ministry of Christ, and he accomplishes those purposes. And then we think about our own context, and you think about the things that God has, has done in your life, and how he has kept his promises. We have confidence in the hope of Christ. We have confidence in our faith in Jesus Christ because God always keeps his promises. And because he keeps his promises, we can have confidence that our faith will persevere. I think it's important for all of us to, to be mindful of the fact, and I know this is a truth that we, we know, but sometimes we may forget the author of your salvation is not you. The author of your salvation is Christ himself, is the Lord himself. When he beckons you to himself, when he gives you the faith to believe in him, he's the one that sustains you. He's the one that's going to keep his promises. We're reminded in Philippians chapter 1 that he who began a good work in you We'll bring it to completion. We'll bring it to completion. We'll bring it to fulfillment. So as we consider this hope that we have, good old Baptist term is once saved, always saved. Perseverance of the saints. When we consider that truth and that principle, that is anchored in the fact that God is faithful, not in our faithfulness. The only way that we are able to exhibit faithfulness, the only way that we are to be found uh, worthy of this salvation is because of the work that Christ has done in us. Because when he transforms us, when he gives us that faith to believe and we trust in him, then he begins a work in our heart, as we've already noted, a work that he continues to do until we meet him face to face, and we begin to model that same faithfulness that he exhibits in our life. We become faithful people because he is faithful to us. God's faithfulness is mirrored in us. As we consider what it means to be a fellowship of believers, we understand that we all share a common conviction, a common confidence in what Christ has done on our behalf. And our faith perseveres in that, in that belief because of what God continues to do in us as he continues to transform our heart. And as we seek to be a faithful follower of Christ, we seek to be more and more like Jesus. Part of the equation in which God accomplishes that is by fellowship. Being with other believers. In fact, as we kind of look back on the other side, I would say the fruit of a persevering faith, of a faith that lasts, is involvement with other believers. Is longing to be with God's people. Again, we go back to our question that we noted in our introduction, thinking about maybe those in our life or maybe a season in our life that we found ourselves there, or maybe someone that's struggling with something right now. 
Those that say, you know, I, I, I'm a believer, or I'm a Christian, or I think I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church. I don't need to be around other believers. As we see in 1 John, as we see in this passage, those that are God's people need God's people. Those that love the Lord love his people and long to be with his people. And we'll see why. We see that the source of our fellowship is that common belief, that common trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the fruit of a, a persevering faith, a faith that doesn't uh, fail, a faith that is without wavering fellowships. Now, as we look at this passage, we see that the purpose of that fellowship, or the result of an enduring faith, is ministry. Look yet again back in verse 24. Now, let us consider, we've got this confession of hope that is without wavering, and now let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you should be considering, you should be under, should uh, seek to find a way to minister to other believers. What is the old saying? No man is an island. You know, as a follower of, of Christ, you're not to be off on your own, just doing your own thing, separated from the fellowship of the saints, separated from the rest of the church. Part of your identity, part of the transformation that's happening in your heart is dependent upon your involvement with other believers. One of the holy habits, if you will, using our terminology, the spiritual disciplines that needs to be cultivated in our heart is a desire to be with other Christians, to be with other followers of Christ. Because as we see here, we are to stir up one another to love and good works. Now, I don't know about you, when I hear the word stir up, that doesn't always give good connotations, all right? At our house, with our three boys, you know, not that our sons ever fight, okay? All right? And of course, our middle child's never in the middle of it, but no. <laughs> but we, you know, the statement is always said, don't, don't stir him up, you know? Don't stir him up, or, or, or maybe, you know, you know, don't stir up dad, you know, whatever. But usually when we think of stir up, it's like, you know, provoke, you know, solicit a response. And usually the kind of response we get at our house is some, some fighting and some yelling, all right? The glimpse into the pastor's household. No, we're not perfect, okay? <laughs> some of you are like, we figured that out the first day, Lucas, okay? But, but here among the brothers and sisters in Christ, it says what? To stir them up. Light a fire under them. There's some good Southern Baptist terminology. Get them going. Rile them up for love and good works. Folks, you're here. God has done a work in your heart, and he's drawn you to his people. And he's drawn you to be with brothers and sisters in Christ so that you may stir them up, so you may fire them up. Not in a way where we get them upset and get them sucking on a holy lemon. Not, not that kind of stir up. We want them stirred up where they love each other. We want them stirred up where they're encouraged to be about good works, encouraged to be about ministry. That's why God redeems us. He redeems us to rescue us from hell and redeems us so that we can glorify him in our, in our life and glorify him together and encouraging each other. You realize your growth as a follower of Christ, impacts the growth of someone else as a follower of Christ. Think about that. So when we find ourselves unplugging from the fellowship of the saints, we find ourselves selfish. We find ourselves full of pride. We find ourselves overcome with thinking, it's all about me. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, one has placed our faith and has confidence in the hope of Jesus. We should be drawn to be with other believers. We should be drawn to the fellowship. Because it's within that fellowship that ministry takes place. So the fruit of enduring faith is indeed ministry among the brethren. Because this, as I noted a moment ago, God uses his people for his purposes. You know, as we talked about, I believe it was... A couple of weeks ago, they're kind of run together after a little while. So we talked about the, the discipline of service. 
Talk about how God has, has equipped each one of us, if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, if we've placed our hope in Jesus and realized that he's our only hope of salvation, and we've given him our life, he gives us a spiritual gift. He endows us with a gift that comes from his Holy Spirit that is to be used for his kingdom, that is to be used for the building up of the church. So when we consider what it means to be involved in Christian fellowship, what it means to, again, hold fast the conviction of, of, of our hope in Jesus Christ and then to live that out among other believers, we realize that that happens because God wants us to use our gift to minister to others. God wants us to use our gift, yes, to glorify him, but then to, to help maybe Adam further his journey with the Lord or maybe Terry to journey further his journey with the Lord. There's this interdependence that exists within a body of fellowship. And we find ourselves unplugging from that. We are creating a deficiency within, our, within, within the fellowship that exists here. God has worked in your life in such a way to bring you to understand how great and marvelous he is, but it worked in your life in such a way that your story, your life, impacts others. We need each other. That's the simplest way I can put it. And God's designed it that way. You know, as we think of the imagery that the Apostle Paul uses in reference to Jesus and, and the followers of Christ, he calls us what? He calls us the body of Christ. And he goes to great lengths to illustrate that. You know, some of it's kind of uh, odd and cheesy, but you know, the fact that you know, the eye cannot say to the, the foot, I don't need you, or the ear can't say to the hand, I don't need you. I know I'm kind of paraphrasing his statements there, but just the, the nature of the fact, when we think about a body, all the parts are necessary. So when the ear decides they're not going to come to church for a while, well, might not work like we need to. Uh, granted, I know that's a little bit out there, but the reality of it is you have a role to play. God has worked in your life to such a point that your personal history has led you to here. At this season, at this time in history, to minister among the brethren and to minister in this community together. That being said, I think it's so important for us to understand that we need to, to discern our role, to discern how it is that I can use my gifting here. You know, as we talked earlier, maybe you're, you're still trying to figure out what your gift is. And if that's the case, I encourage you to speak to me or to speak to um, uh, maybe your Sunday school teacher here within the fellowship. Because if you're a follower of Christ, you have a gift. Many of you have more than one that God has given you so that the, the body of Christ can grow, so that the body of Christ can flourish, so that the body of Christ can be healthy. You've heard me say it a million different times, but your story is not just your story. Your story is his story and how he chooses to use it for his glory in your life and the life of someone else. It's so important for us to be plugged in and in fellowship. The purpose of fellowship is ministry, for him to work through us in the work of others. And this last part here I think is so important for us to understand, um, skipping a little bit to verse 25, and we'll come back to some of it in our next selection. Actually, I'll go back to 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day, capital D, drawing near. Now, a little commentary note. What is the day talking about here? Talking about Thursday? Well, I don't know, maybe. No. The day of judgment. As we talk about the end as it approaches, approaches. Now, maybe from this original context, they may have been seeing how things were unfolding within the, the, the Roman political situation, because we know later in 70 AD, the, the temples destroyed there in Jerusalem. But most likely, likely, as we look at all of it and understand that how this, this truth impacts us in our context, it's talking about a future day. When Christ returns and all things are called into account. It says the fellowship needs each other because Jesus is coming back. He will return. 
And he will return in triumph. He will return as king. So we need to get ready for the king's arrival. You need to get ready for the world to understand or help the world to understand that when he comes back, he means business. So that being said, as we consider our role as a follower of Jesus Christ, as we consider our role in this context as a fellowship of believers here on the hill, yes, we're to encourage each other. And we've talked about that, ministering to each other. That's what we're called to do. We're called to love on each other. We're to cry together. We're to celebrate together. We're to have, lack of better words, we're to do life together. That's one of the beautiful things, you know, it's coming as a, uh, a transplant into the fellowship and you know those first few months of finding out man not many people are related here but you know finding out just how beautiful though whether they're related or not about the family dynamic that exists within this fellowship you know as prayer requests are shared or things are shared or or people are checking up on this person or that person and it's so encouraging as your pastor to know that happens within our fellowship but we also know there's people within our fellowship that are on our church membership roles that aren't here. They need us. And if they may be at a point in their life where they don't realize they need us, we got to make sure they realize they need us. As we've often talked about in connection with our community, and we'll get there in a moment, that we need to make sure we're having a seeking posture as opposed to a sitting posture when it comes to the fellowship. That's what we need to do. I'm thankful for our, our deacons. Every uh, month we have our deacons meeting and kind of have a deacon family report, you know, because our, our deacons are assigned different families within our fellowship. And just to hear the, our, these gentlemen share, okay, I've talked to these people and that people, uh, or that people, these people and others, and this is what's going on in their families. It's a blessing to know that they're connecting. They're seeking out. And sometimes the information they bring back may not be something the pastor wants to hear. You know, I realize there's some that aren't here because they're going elsewhere. You know what? That doesn't bother me. As long as they're going somewhere, they're hearing the gospel, or they're going somewhere and they're plugged in and serving the kingdom. But if we know of people within our fellowship that are not in fellowship with other believers that claim to know Jesus Christ, but are not being with other believers on a regular basis. And I'm not saying they're at church every time the doors are open, because guys, y'all aren't at church every time the doors are open. All right? But what I am saying, if they're not going anywhere, it is our job, as their brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage them to come home. They need us. And guess what? We need them. And it's important for us to note, too, a faith that perseveres, a faith that's real, longs to be a part of the fellowship of the saints. So let's pray for them. Let us encourage them to be back among us. Or maybe that you know someone that you work with or a family member that's made a profession of faith and, and you know they're a follower of Christ and maybe they're still stuck in those infancy stages and they're not plugged into somewhere. As a, as, a, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as, a, as an ambassador for the gospel, it's your job to help them find a church home, help them find a fellowship they can be a part of, whether it's here or wherever, they need to be incorporated into a body of believers so they can continue to grow and so they can exercise the gift that God has entrusted to them. The purpose of fellowship is to minister to encourage, to stir up to good works, especially as we see the end approaching. And as we see the end approaching, I, th I pray that it reminds you of the urgency of the mission too. A day will come when Jesus returns. Will it be tomorrow? Possibly. Will it be 20 years from now? Possibly. As we read the New Testament, we see the writers understand that Jesus' return is imminent, meaning it can happen at any moment. And they lived an expectant life. As we've got further and further away from the New Testament events, I think we've got a little bit more unexpectant. 
But the reality, as we look at Scripture, all things that must come to pass have come to pass. So there should be an urgency about um, how we view ourselves as a fellowship in regard to the, the coming of Christ. And the urgency should be linked to our mission to tell other people. So I encourage you, as you consider your role here at Echota, as you consider your role as a follower of Christ, you have an urgency when it comes to telling others about who Jesus is. You have an urgency in ministering to other believers. You have an urgency in seeing Christ proclaimed above all the other things. Because if indeed we hold fast to that hope that he has given us through his work in our life, we should have an urgency as that day approaches. I just want to encourage you, and I know this is an event that's, that's coming up you know, on our calendar very soon. I encourage you to see what the, our egg hunt is, for what it is. It's not just a fun event we're going to have on our campus for families. Yes, that's part of it. But it's an opportunity to connect with our neighbors. It's an opportunity for them to hear the gospel, because they will hear the gospel. And I, I hope that you know my heart by now that I don't want to host an event on this campus unless the gospel is proclaimed, unless we have opportunity to connect and follow up with families. So I encourage you to pray about how you can be a part of this event. And I realize that, you know, in this room we have some with physical limitations and things of that nature, but I encourage you to pray for this event the fruitfulness of this event. Those that can help, help us with this event, whether it means canvassing, whether it means stuffing Easter eggs, whether it means next week, you know, being here to just to connect with people, run a registration, registration table or hide eggs or whatever it is, all of those things the Lord can use for his kingdom as people come on our campus and have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And then after that happens, after we have information and able to connect with people, then the seeking that, that happens after that. The pursuing family so that they may know who Christ is and plugging them into a fellowship, whether it be here or somewhere, where they can be ministered to and learn about the beauty of Jesus Christ. And we could go on, we could talk about all the other events that happen within the life of a fellowship. We won't do that, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of how having an urgency as the day approaches and an urgency for the mission can be fleshed out within our fellowship corporately. The last thing we want to see as our, our time is slipping away is the, the practice of fellowship. You know, right here we see in verse 25, you know, we've talked about holding fast to our faith without wavering. We've understood that we get together to encourage each other, to minister to each other. And then in verse 25, as we talk about practices, don't neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some. Now, let's think about this for a moment. We're going back in the first century here, and they already got some slackers, all right? They already got some folks that have decided we're not going to go this week. And before you know it, it's a month. It's two months. Scriptures tell us, do not get to the point where you are forsaking the gathering with other believers. Hopefully you've already seen why that's not healthy for us, uh, why, that's not, why that's not healthy for you, but why that's not healthy, healthy for us as a body of believers. We need each other. We, we're dependent upon each other. So the question I think we have to ask all of ourselves this morning is, are we engaged, are we committed to Christian fellowship? And I'm not saying, as I noted just kind of jokingly a while ago, that you, know, you need to be here every time the doors are open. What I'm, I am saying is, are you committed to Christian fellowship, the life of Echota Baptist Church? Are you committed to love on the families that go here? They're a part of this fellowship. Are you committed to support the ministries that happen here? Are you committed to encourage your brothers and sisters and their families that go here? You know, and of course, as we, we think about how we measure such commitment, you know, we, you know, we talk about presence. You know, as I've noted, you know, before some of the frustrations of missed COVID and, you know, having people in the seat as well as online, I'm thankful for those that are tuning in online, but we all realize it's much better to be in the seat. 
And I am, again, thankful that we're seeing more folks come back to the physical campus. But I encourage you to make it a priority to be engaged in fellowship the best that you can. Make it a priority to be physically present to support those in times of need. Be physically present to grow together as followers, disciples of Jesus Christ. Be physically present to work together to reach our community for Christ. We all know it happens in every church. You know, you got 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. You know the old adage. It doesn't have to be that way, and you know it. We need to be involved in the fellowship. We need to be engaged in the fellowship. Because if indeed we hold to the hope that Christ has given us, then we know that he has done such a work in our heart that we love his people. And we love the world in such a way that they must hear who he is. And we're called to work together to accomplish such a task. The last thing we see as we uh, understand this selection is there will be obstacles. And then maybe, maybe you're just coming through some obstacles in regard to your commitment to the fellowship. Or maybe you're, you're wading through it right now. Or maybe you're at home right now because you're in the middle of an obstacle. And I understand the, the, the world shutdown or whatever was an obstacle to fellowship. And we had to tune in uh, to uh, our, uh, our Facebook Live or whatever to watch. But I remember one of our deacons, and I appreciate his honesty, and once we started bringing things back on campus, he said, you know, I'll tell you, Lucas, it was hard getting out of my pajamas and putting that extra cup of coffee down and coming to church today. I got real comfortable just kind of in the front, front room there in my recliner, turn you on, and then turn you off if I need to. But, uh, <laughs> but I appreciated his heart. Now, he's here. He's been here every time the doors are open, but he was real with me. I know it was easy. I'll tell you, it was easy when I could just stay at home in my front room and record a message. That's not what it's designed to be like. We're designed to be together. We're created to be together. We're created to be people in community for each other. And I know as I see some of these room, the, the faces in this room and, and some of the comments shared on Facebook and then to see the delight when they were able to come back in this room with you guys, they missed it. I know some of the conversations I still have from some of our senior adults, they miss this. Let us be committed to each other, to grow together, to support each other, to encourage each other, and to connect with our community together so that they may know the Christ that has given us hope. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for time in your word. And Lord, I do pray that... Um, Lord, you help us to set aside our prideful thoughts. Lord, for indeed, some things that keep people away are, are just selfishness. Maybe they got their feelings hurt in the past, so well, I don't want to be there anymore, but Lord, that's being selfish. Not to downplay their feelings, but Lord, we know that you're a God of grace and a God of restoration. So Lord, we just pray for them. We pray that their heart may experience your grace, and Lord, and that they may take the steps of reconciliation that may be necessary. Father, there may be some that are, have just got comfortable tuning in or maybe have just got comfortable not watching or being there at all. Lord, I pray if they're a follower of Christ, they'll fall under conviction and they'll be drawn back to the family. And Lord, they'll find their family waiting on them, just like old times. And Father, we do pray for those that are here this morning or watching now or later that, that don't know you, that don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. They don't have the support of a Christian community that, that desperately long to know Jesus, desperately long to have forgiveness of their sins, desperately long to have people love on them. I pray that today you can help them to see uh, how great and awesome your love is for them. And Lord, today can be their day of salvation. Father, we pray your spirit moves in a mighty way and that all are drawn to you, Lord, that we'll be obedient to your promptings. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come and lead us, Neil. I'll be down front if you'd like to. All of this story coming together just had God written all over it. Nampa First Southern Baptist Church was, was planted in the 50s. Some faithful folks were here saying we, need, we want to have a, a gospel-centered presence here. So this neighborhood you know, kind of grew up around the church. And then the city grew beyond and, and the church had to either adjust or not adjust to the changing environment around them. 
And so the folks that were left were the ones saying, how do you preach a resurrected Christ with a dying church? We heard about it, the plight of this church, and we packed it all up, me, my wife, my four kids, and, and headed for Idaho. Replanting takes the idea of, of church planting and puts it inside the, the housing of, of existing resources. We're planting not brand new in a brand new setting, but we're building upon the legacy of what was here. And so for us, um, preparing for a launch was a chance to kind of reintroduce ourselves to the community. We, we wanted to take full advantage of that. So it was flyers downtown and it was mailers to the community and it was getting out here to say this new church right here in this old context. And so, um, you know, when, when we launched in February of 2017, imagine a church that has been, you know, 30, 35 people maybe on a Sunday to have 130 people show up in your sanctuary. I mean, those of us who'd been here through that process are looking around like, where'd these people come from? So. Does it matter that this church is still here and hasn't been given up on? Yeah, it does because the watching community now knows, yes, Jesus is alive because he can even resurrect a church from the edge of, of really closing its doors. So that's what we've been able to do because of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. It's a gospel story baked into the story of this church and in, in our lives.